We are here today at the East Ridge Rec Center in Highlands Ranch with Forrest Dykstra, a longtime employee and employee of Mission Viejo. No, you never worked Actually, for Mission Actually, I never worked Viejo, for Mission Viejo State Homes, correct. But you did work for the Metro District of Highlands Ranch and did some work for the Centennial Water and Sewage District as well as mm -hmm. Shea Home later on and even continuing today. My name is Mark Stevenson. On behalf of the Highlands Ranch Historical Society, I'm privileged to conduct this oral history today, August 28th, 2023, again at the East Ridge Rec Center. So Forrest, thank you for coming today. Mm -hmm. We would like to explore with you your background and long history in this community of, gee, over 40, 40 years mm -hmm. at this point. And some unique situations you have um, <clears throat> involved with Highlands Ranch and its leadership in the early days. So again, thank you for coming at this point. We'd love to hear any uh, interesting stories that you would like to tell us about your time here. And I suspect that you might have a, a few being a long-term uh, resident and employee of organizations here as well. So we'll get started. We are going to send this video down to the Douglas County Library local and local history and archive section. The act is our repository and we'll probably publish this in some formats on our own uh, website, thehrhs.org at that point. Do we have your permission to do so? Yes, you do. Okay, very good. We'll send the paperwork down to them. The way that the process will work is we'll do the, uh, the editing of this and send it down to them. They eventually will notify you when they have a transcription ready uh, to, be, to be done. They might have some questions at this point, but eventually it will all get published at this point. So, <clears throat> Forrest, tell me, where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Southern California. Um, don't hold that against me, mm -hmm. but uh, it's been a long time. Uh, since I've been back. In fact, this in September we have our 50-year high school reunion, so it's been a oh, long time are, since I've left. So Those are fun to go <laughs> yeah, those to. Those are fun to go to. So yeah, so my cousin is yeah. organizing it, so yeah, that's I'm good. probably going to try to make it. So yeah. yeah. So no, I grew up in Southern California. Um, uh, went to high school down there with Valley Christian High School. Uh, one interesting thing of note is uh, when I was a freshman, our high school actually played Mission Bayo High School. Uh, in football, so I was on the JV team, and they mm -hmm. they trounced us thoroughly. But uh, yeah. but uh, they had just pretty much started development by that time, so they they were still a small school. We were a small school, so um, uh, it was interesting to play them. Little did I know that I would have a connection with them, you know, ten fifteen years later. So yeah. that was pretty interesting Good. bit of information. So where did you go to undergraduate? Um, from there, I you know as I mentioned, I played football in high school. Went out to Central College in Pella, Iowa and uh, decided to play football in NCAA Division Three, so that was that was enjoyable. I uh, was there for four years, uh, graduated with a degree in biology and a minor in chemistry, and then went on to graduate school at Stanford University to get my degree, master's in petroleum engineering. And so, how, did, how did you pick petroleum engineering? Um, a little bit. That's that, a little bit of a stretch a from bit biology. Of a, a little bit of a stretch from biology, and it was, it was interesting. My, my dad was actually a petroleum engineer, and uh, about that time in the in the late seventies, mid to late seventies, that's when the oil uh, crush was on and, and and embargoes and things like that. So there was a real need for petroleum engineers, and um, uh, he suggested I look into it, and uh, so I did. And it was interesting because when I was in graduate school, I asked one of my professors. I said, "Why would you select me? I don't have an engineering background. Um, why would you?" Pick me to go to graduate school here, and he said we're actually looking for good scientists. And petroleum engineering is a little bit different in that it's more of a an earth science as opposed to a, a, mm -hmm. a civil engineering science such as structural or mechanical or things like that. So, so at that I felt a little better. We had some students who had been pre med. We had some geologists, so we had a pretty wide range of students. So um, enjoyed it immensely. Enjoyed my my time at Stanford and uh, graduated in '79. Went to work in Salt Lake for uh, Amico Production Company. They'd, they just opened an office there in Salt Lake, so uh, went from there. This is better there about a year and a half. and got transferred to the main headquarters here in Denver, which is where I met my wife. So that's good. So how did you come to meet your wife? Um, interesting story. A, a good friend of mine back home was a, was a youth pastor here in Denver for 
when I was in Salt Lake. So one time on my way through, I stopped and visited him and made some connections with the, with the young adult group at the church there. So uh, when I moved to Denver here, I, it was a natural connection to go there and actually found some friends from back home were going there as well. Yeah, what, and, what church was it that? It was Third Christian Reformed Church in, uh, in Denver. So uh -huh. um, but there was a young adult group that had a Bible study and uh, one of the one of the guys there invited me to join the Bible study. My wife Diane was was in that as well. So um, after about six months, we went out and um, started dating and got married a year later. So very quick. Yep, yep. Very so quick. Where didn't did you, take us long. Where did you live until that time? Um, I lived in in uh, in Denver near uh, near Bible Park. I was about mm -hmm. the corner of Yale and Monaco. So and she had a house here in Highlands Ranch. So when we got married uh, in '82. Uh, we decided to sell my house in Denver and move down here. And uh, I was still working downtown at the time. And um, I'd commute up Broadway. And at that time, there were only 23 light signals between Highlands Ranch and downtown. And I think the last time I went through and counted, there was almost double that many. So it wasn't a bad commute back then. It's, it's obviously a lot worse yeah. now. So and, tell me what's so special about your wife. Um, a lot of things. You know, obviously, she puts up with me. And uh, she's been a great mom to our kids. And um, another interesting thing, obviously, is that uh, her dad was Jim Tepper, the president of the Mission Bay Company here in Colorado, which I didn't realize what that meant when we were dating. And then after we got married and, and, and things, it was, uh, I got a chance to meet some of the people with Mission Bay Company, um, some of the previous people, Joe Blake, Jeff Kappas, Jerry Post, and a lot of those people, and got to know, know fairly well. We play racquetball or, or basketball together, so uh, it was interesting. Diane was actually friends with Jeff in college, so uh, that's that's. Oh, uh, I didn't realize. That. Yeah. Where so did your wife go to college? She went to uh, UNC for two years and then graduated, uh, when then transferred to DU and finished up at DU. So. Yeah. Yep, now, she met did, Jeff did when our, she was up at UNC. We did an oral history with Jeff. Yeah. And he talked talked about being one of the very early hires, mm -hmm. where he was just a young pup. And yep. Didn't know much at all, <laughs> but he was like you. Yeah. Uh, was schooled by interesting mentors, yep. uh, and he was receptive to that, and he stayed a long time. In mm -hmm. fact, Jeff is still uh, in VP of Sales with <laughs> Shea Home, yep. so he transitioned from Mission Viejo to Shea. eventually to Shea mm -hmm. uh, at this point, and yeah. remains there still today at this point. You met your wife. You said you got married a year later. Yep. Eventually had a, a couple kids. Had two had two children. Uh, our daughter Laura. Yeah. Um, in '83, and then our son Will two years later in '85. So, yeah, yeah we lived in the Groves, uh, just south of, of where the Northridge Rec Center is now. And when we got married, Broadway ended at South Park. You know, the the churches weren't yeah. there yet, so it was a lot of open area. Um, missions and building later uh, wasn't at that time. Um, the Metro District Office building wasn't even there, and the rec center was just the original small rec center with the outdoor pool and things like that. Obviously, the community was pretty small, and we got to know pretty much everybody in the community at that time. And uh, In fact, one of our neighbors was Phil Scott. He lived two doors up from us, and uh, we became good friends with Phil and Kay. And uh, their kids, are, we still keep in touch with, with their son. Many people have told us that uh, there were three developments initially when mm -hmm. Mission Viejo was not only the community developer, but the home builder, mm -hmm. almost exclusively the right. home builder at this point. Tell us, tell us about the Groves. Uh, the Groves were um, the, the smallest homes that they were selling at that time. Um, prices were in the 70s to, to 80s for, for homes at that time, so uh, obviously it's a, a big switch since then. And then they had the uh, Bayfields, which were kind of the mid-range, and then the Stony Points, which were the the, the larger homes, and then obviously as, as time went on, they developed some of their uh, higher end and, and larger homes and some of the uh, attached housing uh, products that they had as well. So this is all in the area around Northridge? Correct. And the Correct. Northridge Rec Center and right. the Northridge Park. Yep. yep. You had some involvement with the Northridge Rec Center when eventually it was built, because it wasn't there initially when the community opened in 1981. Right, right. And I was, I was um, actually, um, after uh, coming back from Wyoming after uh, uh, losing my, my employment up there, we moved back here and was looking for work. And during that time, they'd opened up the rec center, the expansion of the Northridge Rec Center. So I was working there part time while I was was looking for for a career to to, to start on. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All, all very good. 
was the uh, the park there at that time too? The park was there, yeah, not to the extent that it is now in the shelters, but uh, the main ball fields were there, and, and some of the big open play areas and the playground. Uh, the playground has been replaced since then, and the parking lot's gotten a lot bigger. But uh, but yeah, the park was there. I understand Jim Teffer was really big on swim teams, particularly mm -hmm. from his background in California, where they had a U.S. famous right swim team at yep. this point, and he wanted a big pool here and wanted a big swim team yep. at this point. When was the pool built? Boy, that's a good question. Uh, I think the the indoor pool I know was added in, in 86. They opened that in the fall of 86, the indoor pool. It had an outdoor pool before that, but when they did the expansion, I think they did some renovation and, mm -hmm. and redid the outdoor pool and made it a little bigger as well. Yeah. So Good. So I understood that with your relationship to the daughter of one of the founders of Michigan, you might have had some experiences at the Hounds Ranch Mansion, which was <laughs> prominent in the community at this point for Mission Viejo. Tell us about any experiences that you had there. You know, it was it was kind of uh, enjoyable, and again, I didn't realize realize the Im impact and, and how important Jim was at, at that time, and when when we were dating, and even up and. Until we were married, but uh, we had uh, they had picnics out there in their company picnics, and I can remember going to some of those and swimming in the in the pool that was in back of the mansion that's no longer there. They they took that out sometime in the in the 90s, I think, or late 80s. But uh, the pool was back there, and we swam in there, and they had, had company picnics up there and softball games. Um, we also would have family time up there and get us get to spend some time up there with Diane and and her sister and their family, and and just have an enjoyable time up there. Just just hanging around out there, and um, we used to be able to hunt back there too. Obviously, that was before the development occurred. And um, I do remember one time we were back behind the mansion with uh, with Jim and Phil Scott and one of the other vice presidents with with Mission Viejo Company. And uh, uh, there was a Philip Morris function going on, and and the guy I was with um, took a shot at a dove going by and actually rattled some BBs off the the mansion roof and. And uh, we kind of got a little bit of trouble for that, but uh, <laughs> once imagine. they saw who it was uh, with us, uh, uh, the, the the foreman at the time kind of told us to just be a little more careful. And I wasn't the one that took the shot; the guy I was with who uh, who will remain unnamed. But uh, did you get the dope? Uh, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember. That's good. <laughs> Let's talk about the swimming pool. Occasionally, I have seen pictures. Of of a swimming pool with a slide with mm -hmm. kids going down it at one of these Mission Viejo corporate parties in mm -hmm. the summertime. Who built that pool? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I think it was built as part of the, the FIPS when, when FIPS owned the mansion. It was there earlier. Yeah, it was here earlier. So, the yeah. pool, as I understand it, is just on the outside of the metal fence just south of where the gazebo is now after the reconstruction. Uh, yeah, I, I would say it's probably would have been directly east of the gazebo, kind of off the corner of what, what was the carriage house at that time. So, okay. yeah. All right. But it was enclosed in a fence, obviously, just to keep people away and, and animals from wandering That's in. Good. So, yeah. So the pool was there, but eventually Mission Viejo, at least through 93, yeah. still owned the property. Right. It wasn't used terribly often, as yeah. I understand it. I, yeah, I think the pool went out, you know, was used by, by some of the employees of, of Mission and their families and things, but I, I want to say it came out in the late late 80s. And pools are money pits to yep. some degree. Yep. They, they, they take some maintenance. And also liabilities if, if people that sneak too. in there. So Yeah, that too. Okay, we've always wondered that. Uh, <laughs> I've seen the pictures, and there's been some question of whether it was a above-ground pool or an in-ground pool. Yeah, it was in-ground. So My understanding yep. from the pictures that it was an in-ground yep. pool. Um, so that's good to know too. Any other activities involving your connection with Diane and with Jim? Tepper, um, you know, that you'd it, like to talk about. Yeah, it was. Uh, we were able to have our wedding reception back up there in '82, oh, which uh, nice. which was a, a nice time. And uh, what was yeah. your memory of the building at that point? You know, it was a it was a a, a massive building, and and um, uh, and and obviously of the. The improvements that the district did in, in, in 2011 and 12 weren't there, so the, the building was kind of chopped up, so it was difficult to get everybody in one room. And I can remember wandering around with Diane from room to room trying to trying to visit all the people that we needed to see. And at one point in time, we split up because she had family in from Wisconsin and I had family in from California, so we kind of split up and then didn't get a 
chance really to, to see each other until until we left uh, left you the did reception. An indoor, so. an indoor wedding. It or was an outdoor? An, uh, it was the, the we just had the reception there. Our wedding was at uh, the Lutheran Church that was at the corner of Colorado Boulevard in Hampton. So which okay. later burned down. <laughs> and that's Bethany Lutheran. Correct. My Correct. home church. Oh, that is okay. Actually. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, it's been changed a few times. Yeah, it's been changed a few Obviously, times. Obviously, it was rebuilt in faith in yep. 86. Yep. But didn't know he had that yeah, connection. Yeah, that's, that's where we were married. So. I understand that Christ Lutheran, which is across from the Northridge Rec Center, on broad, just west on Broadway, is there because Jim Tepper grew up Lutheran, and he needed churches yep. in the community, mm -hmm. just as well as he needed elementary and eventually middle schools and high schools as well. And so it's not surprising that one of the first churches in Highlands Ranch was a Lutheran church. Correct. Yeah, that yeah. was that was always one of one of his visions of, of a community was making sure they had the things that are important to people, such as churches and the community services and the schools. But uh, churches were always always important to him. And uh, you're correct; he was a member of the Lutheran church here um, in uh, near Ken Carroll when when Highlands Ranch started to develop, and then moved his membership over to Because Jim, to Chrysler, Jim lived uh, along with Greg McCallum yep. in houses over in Ken Carroll. Oh, correct. Uh, in spite of the Bentonite yeah. problems that <laughs> McCallum had. Right, yeah. Jim had a few too, not as bad as, as Craig That's did, true. but uh, yes. My understanding is when the community was, and the infrastructure was being planned, the development plan in the late 70s, basically, that Mission Viejo had an office in Inverness. Mm -hmm. uh, you weren't involved right. at that point, but eventually uh, <clears throat> things got built and there. things opened up yep. in the summer of 1981, mm -hmm. from what I understand. So Gary Danny and Bill, yep. and Phil Scott and a few of the other were some of the, the first uh, early residents, mm -hmm. if you will, at that point. So eventually it got to the point that you were... Uh, you were employed by somebody that we know, Jeff Case, yep. when he decided uh, that he would staff some of the engineering people himself instead of how it had been done previously. Talk about how that all occurred. Um, you know, in talking with Jeff, and, and, and he would need to verify this, but um, um, back in, 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 in the uh, mid-86 to late-86 time frame, uh, Mission made the decision that, hey, we we our, our engineering subsidiary has been the staff for the Metro District, but it's time that they have their own staff so we don't have that um, uh, vision or, or image of, of, you know, staffing the Metro District, the public agency with our own engineering. So in 86, um, they, they, uh, they asked Jeff if he would be, become the district engineer, and, and he accepted. And, uh, um, and, and then in October, and that was in October, and then he had a few months to hire his own staff. He took some of the staff over from the Rob company and some of our support staff. Um, some of the other support staff we hired is, is on. But then uh, uh, I interviewed in, in, in November and in December of 1986. They, they offered me the job and I accepted and, uh, and uh, was able to, to start work for Jeff at that time. So You never worked for Rob, though? I did not ever work for the Rob company. I understand. Correct. Yeah. This point. Yeah. So what were some of your first assignments working for? Metro yeah. district as it, a new engineer. It was, uh, it was a little bit different switch from petroleum engineering, obviously, but uh, some of the project management experience I had uh, carried over, so I was able to to, to use some of that experience in, in first starting. Uh, one of the first projects was the expansion of the water plant. Um, we had some great staff from the Rob company who were managing that, as well as the engineering company that designed it, but uh, Jeff assigned me to be the the project manager or the project rep, I should say, owner's rep on it. So had some good project managers that we learned, learned a lot from, but uh, just kind of kept track of that and, and did that. Uh, some of the other projects were um, we widened university in front of uh, Highlands Ranch High School because Highlands Ranch High School is getting ready to open and, and widened Quebec Street in front of the, the new models that they were going to be opening up there. So, And then in 87, we extended Highlands Ranch Parkway from where it ended at Ridgeline all the way west out to Santa Fe and, and then from Benefort all the way to, to um, University. So those were the two big projects and we started design that spring and had the roads built by the end of the year which um, is, would be kind of unheard of in, in today's environment in terms of environmental compliance and plan review and, and all the things you need to need to comply with to, to get projects done like that. So If you're doing a project like that today, which groups would need to be uh, involved in approving something? You know, at that time, 
Highlands Ranch was undeveloped, and all of our all of our drainage ways were dry, so uh, we didn't need any any of the wetland 404 permits that we that we at that time. But uh, since since that time, as as communities developed and you know, we've developed some waterways, we would need environmental clearances and and some of the Endangered Species Act. We would have to do all that. Uh, um, fortunately, when Mission Plan, they did a uh, Highlands Ranch. They did a tremendous job of of doing all the groundwork and all the investigation. They had a lot of cultural and archeological studies done. And the roads that we were building at that time, we didn't have to um, uh, go through any of that process either because the, the, the roads were in a location that didn't have any of those significant Good. impacts. So. I understand one of the endangered species you had some involvement with is the pronghorned antelope. <laughs> They're not really endangered, but when we first uh, uh, moved out here, we, we had photos of, they were on the hillside Hills, hillside behind where the Christ Lutheran Church is and where mm -hmm. Mission's building is. And when we built Highlands Ranch Parkway out, uh, after we, we did our first pass of paving, uh, the next day we came back and there were antelope tracks in the middle of the road. So Interesting. we left them there for as long as we could. So, you know, my first home in Highlands Ranch was over at in Westridge. Okay. And it was on Painted Canyon. Okay. And when they built the house, Richmond American built it. This was in the mid 90s, whatever. Uh, there was nobody behind me. Yeah. So I moved in, and the first uh, morning I woke up, again, I had no blinds at this point. <laughs> I look up, and what's out in my backyard, 20 yards away, is the herd of pronghorn antelope. <laughs> and they lived there, and then what became the Highlands Ranch Golf Club yep. at this point, but eventually they built houses, and yep. they moved somewhere else mm -hmm. at that point, but they were still yep. around. If we were to look for those tracks today, where would we look? Oh man, that that's a good question. I I want to say it's probably in the vicinity, uh, probably a little bit west of um, where Wildcat Reserve Parkway comes in, kind of west of where Thunder Ridge comes. Okay. Thunder Ridge High School is in that area out there, so yeah, all down the end. So yeah, that's good. So, okay, so initially you worked on roads and right. you worked on um, um, water and sewage projects. Right. We had a, Joe Blake was very instrumental earlier on, 1980, when mm -hmm. he started in getting some of the permits to get all that stuff to work. In fact, they named the, the water treatment plant after mm -hmm. Joe. You started working in, what, early 97 at uh, this point? Or no, early, um, actually it was late 86 was when late I started. Late 86, yeah, yeah, excuse so. me, 86 yeah. at this point. Um, were you adding on to the existing plant, and was it called the Mission of Yeovil Water District at that point, or had they transitioned to the Centennial name at that point? I think they transitioned before that to the Centennial um, yeah. Water and Sand District, and that was a result of the, the movie Centennial being filmed up at the mansion. That's how they selected that name, uh, Centennial, uh, for the Water and Sand District, just to, to uh, distinguish it from, from Mission Viejo, because there was the Mission Viejo Aurora, obviously, and they wanted to, to kind of set it aside here. So um, we always like to say we were Centennial long before the city of Centennial came along. So yep. we still get calls on, on that on occasion saying, how come we don't get water and sewer from you? Well, we were Centennial first. So. Well, there was some feedback or some pushback of don't Californicate Colorado. And certainly when the development plan was being done <clears throat> and there was some resistance, you weren't here just at that yeah. point uh, to that. Lots of people were fearful that this would be a California type of development that would be unstructured. But most people didn't know that Mission Viejo, with Teffer's involvement as a city planner, was into a planned community, it, it, very different than mm -hmm. what you would find in California. And most people didn't know of the successes that they'd had right. south of Los Angeles and Orange County on a project that was about half the size of what they bit off here mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. Uh, but eventually those um, perceptions were changed and things were overcome and it turned out okay at this point. So you were adding on to an existing plant that had been built from scratch. Correct. The original, a few years earlier yeah. than that. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when uh, Highlands Ranch first started, they did have to have water service and sewer service. So they, they designed the, the sewer treatment plant and they had a small plant to begin with. And then um, in the early 80s, um, expanded it and then and, and they were able to modify it so it, it could handle the, the lower flows initially. But they built it to um, <clears throat> for full, full build out. So it was some good design and some good planning on that. On that. With the water plant, they had a, 
uh, the initial water plant, I think, was three or maybe four MGD, and then uh, in in '85 they said or '86 they said we need to start and start our expansion. So, and again the same thing, they designed it and built it so that we could add on as as time went on and and to, to the full capacity that was needed to serve Highlands Ranch. So you know, it's hard for us to realize the the vision that these people had. Initially, they were thinking that this would be a community of 100,000 people after 25 years. Yeah. Now, ultimately, it took 40 years to, to come to right. those numbers, but they, they built the roads, and they built the infrastructure, and the water, and the sewage, yeah. and the drainage, and everything else that went along with that for a community that was going to be appreciably bigger in size, though it might take many years to get there. Mm -hmm. Most developers don't do that. You know, they and and I really credit Mission, and I think um, uh, they relied a lot on, on Jim's experience in California. You know, he when he moved out after he graduated from from University of Wisconsin and went to work for for the um, uh, I don't know if he worked for City of Santa Ana first in the Orange County or vice versa, but uh, he saw the results of not good long term planning. So when when um, they invited him to be part of the original planning for Mission Bay Company, he said, "Okay, I've got to." chance to do things right from the very beginning. And you can see that experience and, and that, you know, came over here to Highlands Ranch and, and the, the, the whole community was master planned in so many different ways, whether it was our roadways, our, our storm drainage, our water and sewer plant and, and all of those things. And, and considering it was 40 years to get it built out, it's pretty close to the original plan, which, uh, you know, they had a great team of planners and great team of, of engineers um, Working and it was a, it was a it was a joy at times we butted heads with mission on some things but for the most part it was it was fun planning and, and building this community. The late 80s and starting into the 90s was the big decade for growth in Highlands Ranch. Mission Viejo in the late 80s had decided to stop being the exclusive home builder mm -hmm. and decided to get into land sales and so they would sell a chunk of land to a builder like Richmond America, uh, Richmond American, who were home builders. Mm -hmm. and so that geometrically increased the uh, number of people and homes being built and the need for infrastructure that needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. In particular, roads. You've talked about the additions to both east and west to the Highlands Ranch Parkway and Obviously, other roads meant, as you indicated on Broadway, and there's many more lights <laughs> now, and so that required traffic controls right. in Highlands Ranch, too. You had some involvement with this infrastructure, too. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when we first started here, obviously, there wasn't enough traffic, even though our roads were six lanes wide, and, and everybody go, why are the roads so wide? And, and our response was, well, we're planning for the future, and now uh, people almost think Broadway's undersized at six lanes wide, but um, uh, it, it's not. But um, uh, as traffic went on, they said, okay, we're going to need traffic signals. And initially the Metro District was uh, tasked with building the the uh, traffic signals at the major intersections, uh, such as Broadway and Highlands Ranch Parkway or Broadway and Dad Clark and University and Dad Clark. So got into the signal business. So uh, that was kind of a, a, a new task for me. And again, Got to work with some great traffic engineers, some great signal designers, and, and learned a lot, a lot from them. And and uh, one of the one of the things that, that that I found is is not having a background. A lot of this, I got to ask a lot of the, you know, dumb questions. And, and sometimes it, it would make our make our engineers sit back and think, okay, why do we do it like that? And um, uh, so that that was that was the fun part of my job was getting to ask some of those questions and, and learning a lot. And uh, and that was a. a a profession that was constantly constantly changing and then and again traffic engineering is a little bit social engineering because you're trying to determine how people drive and and predict how they're going to drive which um, isn't always the easiest thing to do so um, we built the major intersections and the first two we built were at Dad Clark and Broadway and Dad Clark and University and uh, they, they seemed to go well and and uh, then as we went on the next signal was at uh, uh, Plaza and Dad in Broadway, so it's close to where the Metro District exactly is close to where the now. exactly so. And I lived across the street. I lived uh, when we moved back from from Wyoming. I ended up uh, purchasing one of the uh, old Bayfield models home just north of the rec center. So uh, when I got got hired on, it was great. I could walk to work, so I walked to work for for thirty plus years, which was 
I kid everybody, it's it's added life or years to my life as well as some other people's lives yep. that I'd be commuting with. So, um, so yeah, so then the third signal we built was at, at Plaza and, and Broadway. And, and unfortunately, um, just about everything went wrong with that signal that could. It took us about three months longer than it usually does. And the, the, when the, when the contractor was ready to set the pole, the mast arm, he had the pole set and he put the mast arm out. And because we utilized the curved mast arms, there's an angle on the plate on, on the mast arm to the to it. and the manufacturer had the angle wrong so when he put the mast arm up the end of the mast arm was about four feet off the road. And this so, should be what about 15 feet? Uh, yes exactly 13 to 15 feet off the yeah. road so it was like you've got to be kidding me how in the world can this happen and of course it happened at the project that I get to walk through every day on the way to work so um, needless to say we, we had to take it back down and, and, uh, and make the appropriate adjustments to to get it taken care of, but uh, you know, since that time, Douglas County has rebuilt that signal mm -hmm. completely. But um, yeah, that was one of the funny things that that happened with our signal design and, and, and Even construction. Even today, on Highlands Ranch Parkway, not too far from the post office, they put a put a signal in there. Mm -hmm. And is that Douglas County doing that, or is the Metro District? You know, we we had planned to put most of the signals in out here. We actually did uh, a study. Uh, based on the, the the planning areas and the densities and where the roadways would come in, which was amazingly accurate at the time, and we just made some predictions and, and where they'd put the signals in. Um, and over the years, we'd we'd add them as we'd go. And then um, uh, as time went on, we determined that okay, we didn't need quite as many signals as what we had planned. And uh, uh, so we we had them all pretty much done. There's a couple signals left in our facility plan, but since that time, the Douglas County has identified the need for a couple that to, to build, and they actually built the one at White Bay and University, and they just finished the one at Grace and and, and Fairview as well. So it's right. been a that's good the, yeah, that's partnership. The new, that's the newest. One. That's the newest one exactly. Yeah. So it's been a good partnership with them. They're they're building a few signals as as outside influences and outside traffic comes through. It, we kind of didn't feel it was our responsibility to do it, but uh, but the county who traffic pays, staff who is. Who pays for these things? Um, do we, the taxpayers, pay for it all? They were the part of our facilities plan for the for the Metro District or facility plan, and in there we identified all the major infrastructure that was needed to serve the community, whether it was roads, storm sewers, traffic signals, parks, parkway landscaping, trails, and that's the system development fee that that uh, that every home and every development here pays. It's a per acre basis. Our our finance department would take the facility plan and say, okay, we have so many acres we have to develop and, and divide that total number by the number of acres and come up with a, with a number for that. And it's been consistent the last 10 or 15 years. We haven't modified it all, but, but so it was, it yeah. was into, the, into the cost of the home. Since that time, the, the county, if the county builds one, it's part of our taxes that pay for that. Okay. So. That's good. Talking about roads, there's a debate between concrete versus asphalt. I had been told initially that some of the roads, like Highlands Ranch Parkway, initially were built concrete because they thought that they would last longer. And the financial people thought that it would be advantageous long term to build them concrete if they had a deep pocket partner like Philip Morris mm -hmm. that could pay the initial construction costs that would be higher than using something like asphalt that would take right. more maintenance over right. time. And they said basically that would be a better financial decision if you were in it for the long term. Right. And I, I think a lot of that had to do, and that decision was made before I, I, I went to work for the Metro District, but in my conversation with the people that made the decision, they did the evaluation and said, you know, we're going to be building these roads, these major roads to serve the community, Highlands Ranch Parkway, University, Broadway, and recognizing that the the taxes from the development are going to lag that quite a bit, um, they didn't want to burden burden the county with a with additional maintenance requirements. So the initial um, plan was to build all of our materials out of concrete, and, and amazingly, they they've held up um, a long time and very well uh, without having to be rebuilt. There's there's a few areas that have been rebuilt just because of the they far exceeded their life based on design life and based on loads and what things. What is the lifespan of that? Oh, based on traffic, of course. You know that 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 depends. Typically, we would design for a forty-year life, mm -hmm. but um, you know some of our roads are well over forty years old and still the original pavement. So yeah, yeah, we're into a different phase now of the community. Uh, we're not into the 
the go-go growth of the 90s Correct. where new stuff was being put in, we're into the maintenance aspect of it now. Right, and and again, it's unincorporated. We don't have a, a city government or a city agency to, to take care of these things. Uh, when we would build the roads, we would uh, dedicate those to Douglas County after, after a warranty period, and then Douglas County has assumed maintenance on that. So having the history of building these roads and knowing all that went into it, we work closely with them and and uh, they've developed a maintenance program and, and every year we, we sit down with them and, and go over what where they're going to be doing maintenance, what needs we see and being, being boots on the ground here, so to speak, in the community. Um, we can kind of give them some insight on some things. So it's been a good partnership and and uh, the last few years they've, they've stepped up with a lot of the, the work they did a number of years ago to help some of the ride quality with the grinding they did. Um, Again, it's a, a little bit of a struggle to keep up with it because it's it's you know the growth in the county is is um, pretty good throughout the throughout the county, not just in the incorporated areas, but in unincorporated as well. So they've probably had a pretty good task um, ahead of them trying to keep up. But uh, for the most part, they've done a pretty good job of keeping up with with uh, our road maintenance. Well, this we certainly notice what's going on with yeah. the roads because this is the the building season, right. the maintenance season now. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to the, com the cold wall water or the cold weather yeah. and the frost yeah. and the other issues that yep. come up from there. So, so when you travel Highlands Ranch Parkway at Quebec, which <laughs> I live close to, yep. uh, there's <laughs> been some interesting uh, uh, display signs up saying yep. major delays possible. And uh, they've been, they've happened. Yeah, They've the, happened. Yep. And when I travel throughout the community these days, I see lots of lanes closed yep. or different maintenance projects primarily, but they're patching yep. stuff uh, in the concrete yep. cracks and things yep. like this and replacing curbs and things that you do in a community mm -hmm. that's 40 years old. Yeah. Yeah, that point. Another thing you talked about just briefly I'd like you to explore more would be drainage ways. Yeah. I don't understand that. Help me with that. Yeah, when, um, like I mentioned earlier, when uh, Highlands Ranch developed, all the all the drainage ways were, were pretty dry. We didn't have a, a consistent What do you flow. consider a drainage way? Uh, anywhere where our, our major, major gulches. We've got four major gulches in Highlands Ranch, Spring Gulch on the west, and then uh, uh, Marcy Gulch, which flows by in Thunder Ridge High School and through the golf course, yeah. and then um, Dad Clark Gulch, Dad which Clark. is pretty much the center of the community and, and drains about 40% of the community and drains into McClellan Reservoir. And then Big Dry Creek on the very east end and goes right. north under C-470 and, and on into uh, uh, City of Centennial now in Arapahoe County. So, um, and then there's a lot of fingers and tributaries are those. So uh, when Mission planned the community, uh, the decision was to made to leave those, those corridors open for a number of reasons. Um, one of them, they're, they're great utility corridors for water and sewer. Um, also provides recreation corridors with our trails and, and our intent was to was to tie our whole trail system be able to go from park to park and, and traverse the community use, utilizing the trail system as much as we can uh, but as as development occurred we get a lot of what we call urban runoff or it was one of the mile high flood district guys like to call it urban drool um, and it's it's a consistent flow in almost all of our drainage ways now where we've got a base flow and it, it creates issues in the sense that our drainage ways are fairly steep and uh, it creates erosion both both in the bottom and on the sides of it. So um, as time went on, we, we started to see some experience, some serious erosion along our drainage ways and uh, work closely with Urban Drainage and Flood Control District, now Mile High Flood District, and um, said, okay, we need to start doing some protection and some repairs and some maintenance in some of those. So. Did our first project in 1990 as big drop structure behind Northridge Park. We had a series of three drop structures. It was a grouted boulder drop structure, which was the, the design in vogue at that time. And um, uh, once one of our bigger ones, and it's held up real well. Um, but as time went on, we I got to work with a lot of different engineers and the staff at Mile High Flood District, and we got to do a lot of different treatments in our open space. And we try to use use as much natural treatment as we can. We call bioengineering. Did a number of projects with those that have worked real well. We try to find materials now that blend in better with the with the environment around there, whether it's our colored sculpted concrete um, or we just use rock to do it. So it's it's been a real transition in the 30 years since we did our first project on on how we do it, and and we don't use grouted boulder drop structures much anymore, and and uh, 
Part of that is because eventually those grounded boulder drop structures will need to get rebuilt. And in working with uh, my life flood district, they say hey, we need to be a little bit more sustainable in that respect. So they've gotten away from some of the hard fixes that they've that they've used in the past. So you see any effect of climate change on the drainage ways from uh, higher erosion or something else? You know, you asked me that, you know, a month after the tornado went through Highlands Ranch. So <laughs> that was pretty unusual. Yeah, that was, uh, was highly unusual. Yeah, we, we, I remember in the early 80s, uh, we had, had one almost touch down over, over west of the community here. So, um, you know, the, the, the climate changes all the time. So, and, and it's a, it's a long-term thing. We design all of our facilities to the standard of a hundred year, hundred year, um, Flood, flood, exactly. Yeah. So we designed all of our our detention ponds and all of our pipe sizing to to accommodate those. And uh, to date, we they they perform very well. The night you know the night of the tornado, I went around and viewed a number of our drainage facilities, and they all held up real well. Um, after the 2013 storm that that wreaked havoc in in northern metro area and Boulder area, um, again our, our our drainage ways held up really well. We have issues in some of them, but uh, in very few instances have any of our facilities failed. So uh, with, the, with the conservative nature of the design and, and we also give ourselves a little uh, uh, extra effort in the design to, to give us a little, little more flexibility and more extra capacity, um, I think we're in good shape. And you know, the standard joke we always had is that the next flood comes, we're gonna go to Highlands Ranch, so, cause we're pretty safe there. Good. Okay, on to a different topic. <clears throat> We're familiar with the 18-month project that occurred to take <clears throat> the Highlands Ranch Mansion mm -hmm. headquarters building that hadn't been lived in in 40 years and turn it into more of a more heavily used community asset event venue right. uh, as well as an historical structure for tours. Did you have any involvement, and if so, what was your involvement with that yeah. long-term project? Yeah, um, that was one of the the more enjoyable uh, projects that I've been able to do was uh, in my time at the Metro District. Um, as time went on, you know, we built all of our roads, all of our major storm sewers are done, most of our traffic signals are done. So um, it was it was okay. We've got other things to go on. We've always got uh, drainage projects to do, and we've got a thirty-year plan for that. Uh, but then the Highlands Ranch Mansion, uh, uh, Shea at the time dedicated it to the district, and, and that was a, a big project for us to take on. And we did a lot of planning on that and, uh, again, had a great team. And, and Jeff was the primary project manager and, and uh, was kind of the assistant project manager. Um, you know, obviously he has a lot of other, other assignments going on, so I was kind of more of the, the field, boots on the ground, day-to-day -day type of activity. So, And it was a real challenging project because we had a pretty limited budget on it, and we didn't know what to expect when we got there. We had some old plans, but we certainly didn't have all the plans for the um, all the different expansions and and, and uh, additions that had been done. So uh, we go upstairs to yep. the history room, and there yep. is a blueprint from 1929 that right. the famous Littleton Arc architect um, had drawn up. Yep, but. That was drawn up in the middle of 1929, and late 29 in September, things changed. Correct. The financial collapse. And those those are the plans that we do have, those and those never got built. built. <laughs> exactly, because the depression from. hit. So. Uh, but it's interesting yeah. still to, to so, see those. Yeah. At that, so that, that was a real challenging project, and, uh, and we enjoyed it. Again, like I mentioned, we had a pretty tight schedule. We said, okay, we're going to open it by by the, um, such and such a date, and, and we May waited. May 2012. Exactly, and, and um, we said, okay, we've got to uh, get things going. So we started with our hazmat assessment and, and found out we we didn't have as much as we were we were worried we were going to have. So we it had would some, have been asphalt? Uh, it would have been some asbestos in the in the house and some of the pipe insulation and in some of the insulation in the attic. So we got that cleaned out. Uh, fairly quickly and, and at a lot lower cost than what we'd anticipated. So there was a yeah. lot of rotting wood up on the balcony on the west end. Correct. Correct. How did so, you handle that in finding people who could match what was still good? You know, we had a had a good again a good field project manager who'd done some historical um, uh, work for the Colorado uh, Historical Board and had had done some work on the on the Grant Humphreys Mansion as well as some other work in Southern Colorado on some historical historical 
a building. So we had a, Mike Magley was a was a great asset to us in that respect, and we just kind of did a searched around and found some some qualified. I'm going to call them artists because they weren't really just laborers or contractors, and and uh, just by sheer luck found some of them and, and were able to do a lot of the a lot of the replacements of the of the uh, uh, custom woodwork and custom stonework and that was at the mansion. So. The sunken courtyard, I saw pictures of a highly deteriorated outdoor terrazzo. Right. And did you find a specialist that could put in a replacement for that? Um, you know, the, the, the one interior courtyard we ended up actually kind of filling in and that's about where the elevator sits now and some of that area is there. Uh, the interior terrazzo had the serious cracks in it and our, our um, our contractor found found somebody that could repair that work, and, and you can still see the cracks, but they're sure. smooth, and but they're a lot smaller than they were, and it's just a, a, a history of, was, of that. I, it was explained to me at some point that that crack developed over the boundary between where there was a crawl space on the south side after Frank Kistler had yeah. moved the back wall back 15 feet, yeah. and the rest of the thing by the fireplace of the solarium, yeah. uh, which was on grade right. at that point. You know, that that could be because there is a crawl space that runs all the way from the, from the east end to the west end. to get to the west that, end. Exactly. Somehow. Yep. Yep. And so I guess that's how it was done. That was, that was in the, that area. Exactly. Yeah. So, yep. So. Interesting. The outdoor terrazzo in that sunken courtyard. Was, right. I understand it wasn't replaced with a, a pure terrazzo. No. Product, but something that looked like it. Correct. We worked again with our with our contractor, our specialty contractor, on that because we had to repour the whole front uh, patio. Uh, we were able to keep the the columns in, in in place. And another interesting story with that. But all the steps had deteriorated because of the salt usage on them, north facing. So uh, the concrete had deteriorated in all those areas. So um, we worked closely with a, with our specialty contractor. And then we got to that. And we said, okay, what can we do here? We want to maintain that feature there as much as we could and try to get back to what we had. So we looked at some different options and it's actually a glass impregnated concrete. They take broken broken bottles and grind them up and, and smooth them out and we mix that in with the with the concrete and, and, and uh, use that to do it. So that was uh, what his recommendation was and it's turned out really well. I'm interested uh, when it snows. Yes. To see the steps going down or up to the mansion at right. the point that they, they don't accumulate ice. And you can see where the delineation is between where there's indoor heating elements right. and where there's not. And, and that was one lesson we learned after seeing the, the conditions of the front steps. And again, north facing um, in, in a public building, we wanted to make it as safe as possible and not have to sand or salt the front desks for, for safety, or I mean front steps for safety reasons and also not to track it into the, into the facility as well. So. So again, um, as we were going through, and this was one of the items that was kind of marginal whether or not we'd do it depending on our available financing, but with some of the uh, savings from not having to do as much as asbestos for hazmat removal and some of our other, other areas, we were able to save some money. We said, okay, it's, it's important for us to put in a, a, a thermal system that would heat the front steps and underneath there. So we heated the, the, the ramps and the front steps and that kind of that front approach area, and it's, it's, a, it's been a great system. And, I, helps with the with the with the staff not having to worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I totally understand the financing for the renovation project. Can you explain what you know of that? Um, I'm not an expert in finance, so what what my understanding is it was some leftover funds from our facility plan, and uh, uh, we had worked closely with the developer on that in our. Our finance department will probably correct me on this, but uh, they said, okay, you can take those funds instead of rebating us back to the developers. You can take that those funds and use that to, to, to build the mansion. So we had a, a limited amount, so we had to really watch what, what we were doing, and, and we kind of designed as we went and did things as we went by phases. And, and I've heard $6 million, and I've heard part of a $10 million developer fee. Yeah, it was, I want to say it was in the 6 to $7 million range. Yeah. And then part of it, we also left for an endowment to be able to do... For long term. Exactly, for yeah. maintenance on it and uh, maintain the building and uh, do any future improvements that, that we deemed necessary. Mm -hmm. So, 
How but that would be a question for our finance department. Yeah. How did they come to decide on what the ending date would be? I understand it. They opened in May 2012. Yeah, yeah. it was um, when we sat down with our with our architect, and, and we'd started design obviously before before we shut down the building after the the last holiday event, um, and we said, okay, what's a realistic time frame to do this? And uh, uh, we started, and, and after after about six months in, we said, okay, we think we can have it open by summer of, of 2012. So um, we were able to do all the bits and pieces and parcels, did a lot of the work in the parking lot and a lot of the utilities we did the year before, and um, got a lot of that work done, and uh, said, okay, it's reasonable. Uh, and fortunately, we didn't have a, a, a late or wet spring because of one of the things I was most worried about was the front patio and the front steps because that was kind of the last thing we had to do. And and uh, uh, if you get a late spring and everybody knows it can snow here in May and, and uh, we wouldn't have been able to get our, our work done up in the front there and, and all of our landscaping done. So um, it was a tight schedule, but uh, we had great great partners in, in our contractors and, and engineers and, and field people. And, and just it was a great team effort considering we had multiple contractors working in kind of a tight spot at the same time. We didn't have issues with people pointing fingers at each other saying, hey, you're in my way or, or, yeah. or you're, yeah, you got to get out of my way so I can get this done. It, it worked out really well as a great team. Yeah. We're docents at the, at the mansion yeah. today and we look at the things that are there now that weren't there in 2009. Mm -hmm. We look at the fire systems, we yep. look at the air conditioning, we look at all the things, the elevator, we look at all the things that are there today. Yep. And the HVA system is different and yep. everything else. Uh, so it was probably an appreciable effort yep. that went in to make it that all work. Um, you also had outdoor work. Um, you took a roof off of the carriage house. <laughs> you built a wall on the yep. east side to create the great room. Yep. How much did weather affect some of these outdoor related activities that had to be done? You were you were building over the winter, right? Right. Um, fortunately, we got a lot of our outdoor work done done in 2011, and 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 I do remember that summer was I think it set a record for the most days over 95, because I can remember how blistering hot it was working working uh, doing some of the work outside. So um, it was uh, good planning and able to do that and get a lot of those things. And kind of once we closed the building in, we were able to keep the contractor on the inside and be able to work on the outside without getting on top of each other. So did you have some roofing work to do? We did. That was actually one of the first things we did uh, when when the mansion was turned over to us. There were 20 or 30 buckets in the attic that were catching drips from the from yeah. the ceiling. So we we recognized that was the, the the second thing we had to do after our hazmat removal was let's get let's get a roof on this thing and protect it. So how were the windows? Uh, the windows, for the most part, were in pretty good shape. We didn't have to do too much with the windows, so it was it was again that was as we're going through the process and doing our evaluations, we we didn't know what that was going to cost to do some of those things, but a lot of the things were were in really good shape, which again is a testament to the to the artist artisans and contractors and people that did the work the first time. I noticed today that some of the plumbing doesn't work. <laughs> Did you make conscious decisions and saying, okay, we're going to fix this part and we're going to leave the rest of this and, alone? And, and it did, and a lot of that had to do with the, with the fact that uh, we didn't know what was behind the walls and what was in, right. in what kind of case it was, and we didn't want to want to tear down walls to find it out, you know, for two reasons. One, we didn't want to destroy the integrity of what was there. We wanted to keep as much historical things as we could. And also, um, you know, once you get into that, there's a there's a cost associated with that. So sure. uh, we made a made a conscious decision to let's keep all of our, our water and sewer activities on the very east end, where the where the, the the pavilion, the great hall is now, and the kitchen and in that areas, and uh, and we'll kind of let the the west end. We'll leave the bathrooms in place, but they're not hooked up. Yep, exactly. Uh, the elevator went in, replaced yep. the, the pink bathroom. Yep. <laughs> yeah. The yellow bathroom between some of the the bedrooms that the walls were knocked out to create yep. conference rooms mm -hmm. and used for storage. Yeah, well, it's still there. Those things. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of changes. I'm sure that was a fun project. That was that was that was a fun project. Both um, 
one, it was challenging and, and, and obviously meant a lot to this community. And then also because of, you know, our personal connection with it, just with, with, with the Ann's sure. family and things well, like that. What are all the things that you've done there at the mansion? So obviously our wedding reception was there. Um, we had graduation parties that were there. My son's reception was there. My niece's reception was there. And um, a lot of this is before the remodel. It was ob obviously all this yeah. uh, occurred before the remodel. And, and uh, yeah. so that was, that was, it was, it was an enjoyable time. And, um, uh, my wife's book club, she and her sister, their book club got us got to spend a few nights there a few times, and uh, they didn't see any ghosts, but uh, it was... I was going to ask about that. <laughs> uh, lots of people have different stories. Right. We interviewed Jeff Kappas, and he had stories in the early days where he just swore he tore off, turned out a light, and <laughs> when he would look back away again, the light's back on. Yep. And he couldn't explain that. Yep. So, I... Never experienced any of that. The uh, the closest thing that I had to it was when we were in the process and in wrapping up the mansion. Obviously, we installed a, a security system, and uh, um, I was I was number one on the on the on the call list. So there were multiple nights we'd be running up there. But uh, one time we found a bat in a hallway, which set it off. Another time we opened a closet door and a cat ran out, and then there were always raccoons up there. So yeah, in the uh, attic, typically. Yeah, in the attic. Yes, yeah. exactly. That was that was one of the other things we had to do is get a get an animal uh, expert to to remove some of the bats and the mm -hmm. and the raccoons that were there. So first oral history I did for the historical society <clears throat> was with a lady who was in town uh, and was telling us things afterwards to with Susie Appleby. Mm -hmm at the time was was there. And they'd arranged a, a session on a Sunday evening, oh, seven or eight time, eight o'clock at night this time of the year. Yep. And it's quiet. They're up in what's now called the women's sitting room doing mm -hmm. their interview thing. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, that comes flying around, <laughs> where it probably was uh, in the drapes, yep. <laughs> in one of the rooms close to there. And that caused uh, some interesting shrieking around or whatever until eventually that that got taken care of yeah. at that point. Not surprising. Not surprising. Yep. Any other um, interesting stories you'd like to, to tell us about your involvement with the mansion? Um, one of the things that I, that I really enjoyed is when we had to build a new wall, um, uh, for the for the pavilion and the, or the great hall as we like to call it, um, we we had to work closely with our wall contractor to uh, try to match the the stones and the architecture that were in the existing walls. And, and as you can see, there's a variety of, of stone types in there. And, and it was interesting because I was up there just a couple of weeks ago and giving a a, a tour to to someone that we were at an event with. And he was a geologist by background, and and he was intrigued with all the different styles and types of rock in there and, and, and gave me some geology lessons on that. But um, uh, our wall contractor did a tremendous job of, of, of matching it closely and, and to the untrained eye, you can't tell the difference. And uh, Most actually, of that rock came from what you took out to create the, the doorways onto the, the patio. Some of it did, but, but, our, but our wall contractor also found some stone that matched it and then also I knew um, uh, a guy I had worked with who had a lot of petrified wood, and um, he was he was saving it for for, for his son's college education. But um, I knew him fairly well, and we worked together for a long time, and and just a, a, a good guy. And uh, so I called him up when we were doing this. I say, Tom, would you let us have a few chunks of petrified wood out of your 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 pile to 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 build our mansion wall? And he was he was gracious enough to to, to yeah. let us do that. So we went down and. Picked up a few chunks of the petrified wood that 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 I could carry, and were you know were were too massive to put in the wall, and, and got that. So thankful for that connection. Yeah, when docents, when we give tours to the public, we point out when we can all yeah. the different types of rock, right, stone and crystal, yeah. and all kind of things, yeah. including the petrified wood, yeah. Yeah. which stands out yeah. typically. We had interns. A couple of our college interns uh, summer, I had them scour some of our drainage ways and some of the rock outcroppings to find some of that native stone as well to put in there. So, yeah. well, there's a lot of it down at Cherokee yeah. Ranch too. Yep. Yep. Yeah, where so if you ever go on the historic the geology tour there, yeah. they'll take you to a, a very a large outcropping of okay. petrified wood that, there. That that reminds me one other story on the on the front um, porch the the railings there the stone railings there the um, uh, 
the pilasters and the railing um, came from a quarry that's no longer available uh, to get material out of. So we had to fig try to figure out what he needed to do because a number of the pilasters were cracked or broken and things like that. And uh, one of our, our construction manager actually found a concrete specialist guy and we took one of the broken ones and made a form out of it. And uh, then he did different blends of, of a concrete mix and tried to match it and did. And unless you look close, you can hardly tell the difference in some of the pilasters that he cast from concrete and, and, mm -hmm. and placed back in there versus the original sandstone that was there. So that was one of those unique things that, that was fun part of doing the mansion renovation. Recent projects, uh, the senior center yep. is coming up slowly. Yeah. At that point, what's your involvement, if any, with that? I'm the senior project manager for that. And, oh, the senior and, yeah, the senior project, project manager. manager. I guess that's appropriate, huh? So. Okay, so you're going to take all the arrows. <laughs> with the, are you are you on schedule and under budget? Uh, uh, we're we're on schedule. Um, well, we, we lost about a month. The, the rain we had this... Some, they had a very wet... Yes, the, the rain we had this spring, spring came at a, came at, a at, at an inopportune time in yeah. terms of us trying to pour our foundations. Um, and uh, they had the foundation excavation in place and, and it would fill up after a rainstorm and they'd dry it out and then two days later it would rain again. So we, we kidded our contractor quite a bit about, uh, uh, you know, we're, we don't want a boat here, but that's what it looked like for quite a while. So. But we finally got past that, so we're we're about a month behind what our initial schedule was, but it's slated to open late spring of uh, 2024. So where are you now so, in the process? Uh, we've poured our foundation walls, and we're we're starting to get our structural steel on site, and uh, so we'll see stuff coming literally out of the ground here. We're wrapping up all of our site work on that, so uh, that's been an interesting process. Um, again, we got a great team, and and. Uh, um, we're making progress and slowly but surely, but uh, we meet weekly on that and, and uh, uh, The church next door has been a great part partner in that respect We're able to to share parking with them when our when our facility is built and we'll have some excess Parking available for them in the event that they need it for a, for a, a, a big event such as a Christmas Eve service or a Easter service or a wedding or, or something like that so the the neighboring church has been a great partner in that respect as well. So I understand that there were several sites under consideration for the land. Right. The Metro District owned that particular property, but it looked like it needed some significant grading. Right. And and we did a lot of, um, of work ahead of time, but you know before we finally selected that site, we we had three sites kind of narrowed down to three sites. Uh, one of them we didn't own adjacent to Windcrest. One of them was near Tepper Park, and that at that time the school district owned the property, so we didn't own that property as well. And then we we owned this property, so that was obviously a, a big plus. It's um, more central to the community, and too. very central to the community, exactly. So, uh, but it's a challenging site, and that was quite quite a bit lower than than Highlands Ranch Parkway. So uh, we engaged an engineer, a couple of different engineers, say, give us some ideas on some site plans, and can we make it work without having to to bring in hundred thousand yards worth of dirt. So um, our engineering team came up with some good options and uh, we've got a pretty good driveway coming down to it, but uh, the, the grade is working well and it, it kind of sinks it down in the, into the side a little bit so it's not quite as visible from the parkway, but uh, we're, we're happy how, how it's turned out. What's the square footage on the building? Uh, it's 22,000 square feet. So um, somebody actually pointed out to, to Jeff the other day is, was that intentional or was that to match the the, the acreage of Highlands Ranch. So right. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to say it was was intentional, but it wasn't. So that's right. We so. we keep hearing that number on yeah. <laughs> those and tours yep. twenty two thousand square feet yeah. or twenty seven thousand now in yeah. terms of the square footage of yeah. the mansion. So yeah, <laughs> no, but, but see, yeah. go ahead. Any other stories you'd like to impart? Um, you know, it's things it's you'd like to talk about. It's it's been a. a a great place to work and to see the the community develop. You know, when things were were really going crazy in the early late nineties and early two thousands, it was it was a lot of work. We had a great team um, and uh, some great great people to work with, contractors, engineers, um, a lot of different things going on. It's it's been an enjoyable experience, and and it, I didn't get stuck just doing one thing for my career at, at the Metro District and, and living here. So. Um, get to see a lot of the changes and at that time if you didn't get out out of the office For a week or two things would go wow the subdivisions going up right there So and then the transition from mission to Shea obviously was was a big impact and uh, That went 
fairly well. Of course, they kept a lot of the same people, so a lot of the relationships we established yeah, building, uh, continued on. <clears throat> they were building Town Center yep. shortly after that yep. transition. That mm -hmm. point, that was a big addition to the exactly. community. So yeah, yeah. What's in the future for you? Well, um, I've got three grandsons with a fourth on the way, so I'm planning to watch a lot of football and mm -hmm. basketball and do fishing with them and. And, and things like that. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to continue to work for a little bit yet. Uh, you still uh, playing basketball at noon? You know, that's that's that's, that's that's a good 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 point too. Uh, when they did the expansion of the rec center, Northridge Rec Center in '86, they added the basketball court, which it didn't have before. Yeah. And uh, there were a group of us that started playing regularly at noontime, and and we played. Uh, I played for till about 2008 or nine, and and then uh, kind of. Kind of gracefully went off into the sunset. We got to play basketball with a lot of different people in the community, and um, uh, some of the people from Mission slash A played with Tim Amber, who actually played college basketball. So it was always a challenge. And, and some of the guys we got to play with were were some big name stars. Mark Randall would, uh, from Cherry Creek and KU, yep, and remember that. Nuggets fame would uh, yep. would uh, come and join us. So and, and other people. So it, it it was always a great time, a great workout close to the office. Uh, um, which made it convenient to get the workout in over over lunch hour, but uh, it was a it was a great great time to play hoops and got to meet a lot of different people in the community. Unfortunately, when they found out what I did and who I worked for, they would they would always first question, well, what are you going to do about this signal here? That's Can right. you do the timing? And yeah, I'd say, mm -hmm. well, you got to talk to Douglas County about that. Yep, I so. understand. Okay, well, if you don't have anything else you'd like to share with us, I wanted to thank you on behalf of the Historical Society for all of your insights yeah. of. Your many, many years in the community. Very rarely do we think about infrastructure things mm -hmm. just working. We think about them when they're wrong. Right. Or when something's broken. Yep. But we don't tend to thank the people who are responsible for making this the good community that we live in today. Yep. So again, our thanks on behalf of the Historical Society. Thank you for this opportunity. You're welcome.